Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me here. It's a, actually my second time in Australia, but it's been about 10 years since the first time, so it's nice to be back and spend a couple of days. I was hoping it was going to be less cloudy today, and I guess I'm still hoping that there's still the afternoon, so I'm hopeful for that, and thanks to Julie for sharing that. I would say, as we get started, my talk today is about our, my own use or our own uh, evolution of technologies in surface guided radiation therapy, specifically in radio surgery, mostly brain, SRS and SRT, but also a little bit about uh, body, specifically lung, and um, I don't have any financial disclosures um, with anybody. I did not pay for my travel, but beyond that, I have no, no financial interests. So again, I'll focus primarily on brain radio surgery and the evolution from a frame-based solution to our initial go at frameless radio surgery, which was using the optical array system, and then subsequently the current uh, solution that we use with it, which is surface-guided. And uh, I would say, similar to Julie's uh, discussion, that a main driver along this is efficiency and treatment delivery, but also patient comfort. And the whole, both of those are intertwined in an effort in uh, as real a way as possible to try to improve the patient experience. No, nobody ever wants to to be a patient, and people do hate the mask, and they should hate the mask. And so if we can't eliminate the mask, if we can minimize the mask, that's also a step forward. And then um, to that goal, to that end of efficiency, along with the surface-guided delivery of treatment, um, cover a little bit about planning, use, use incorporation of rabbit arc, planning filter-free, and then again in, in the body. So the original uh, and historic approach, but still current approach to radio surgery was with uh, rigid immobilization with the frame. So the frame-based solutions are both Gamma Knife and Linac, and um, of course it's uncomfortable. I would say people hate the frame even more than they hate the mask, and uh, due to the, the pins primarily, it's not torture, but it's certainly not comfortable. Um, and then technically the biggest limitation with the frame or any frame-based approach really is that fractionated treatments are, are not feasible. You, you can have someone come for multiple fractions, but it's unlikely anyone would have that halo attached on subsequent days. So our initial approach at a frameless solution was a combination of the thermoplastic mask, which was not an open face mask, though it did have some cutout. It's still uncomfortable, but less so. And then there was uh, the attachment of the, of the uh, metal array with these reflective markers attached. Um, so in-room monitoring was done via three uh, cameras tracking the fiducial array, so notably the markers are tracking the, I'm sorry, the cameras are tracking the fiducial markers, not directly imaging the surface of the patient. And with, um, also to Julie's point about how safety is important, and she said, uh, I can't paraphrase it exactly, but you know, you'll do whatever to get the treatment right. So, and everyone gets that and everyone agrees with that, but if you can, if you can still get it right and have it be a little bit more comfortable or a little bit less uncomfortable, then that's probably going to be a win. So the concern with any leap to frameless radio surgery is that by abandoning the frame and by leaving rigid immobilization behind, you would sacrifice the accuracy and precision of the treatment and then see that in a subsequent diminution of, of control by essentially by missing targets. But we didn't see that in the reported results and the 12-month actuarial local control in this group of patients with brain metastases was 76%, crude local control 88%. The graph on the right is just control by lesion size as with essentially every series, the Tumors bigger than two centimeters are much harder to control than tumors smaller. And that control rate, that crude, this is all crude numbers, compared really favorably to other results at the time with frame-based solutions as well as other uh, frameless series. So at that point, we were pretty confident that by leaving the frame behind, by going to a frameless solution to radio surgery, we did not have a sacrifice in control of treated lesions. Uh, so we thought that was progress, but still not ideal. Uh, main disadvantage was that it was always a bit disconcerting that it wasn't truly imaging the patient or tracking the patient, but tracking these fiducial markers, again, these reflective balls. And there's the assumption then that the patients will always reproducibly bite the bite block. They did go through testing. They had to seat and unseat the, the, the block 10 times at simulation to see how reproducible it was. But it always felt a little bit unsettling. And then, of course, it was not particularly comfortable. It, it was. Um, it's a big dental mold. I think a lot of people didn't like that. And then certain subsets of patients, those with edentulous patients or bad teeth, it wasn't really applicable to them. So in contemplating next steps, um, we did settle on an approach that was to try to maximize patient comfort and improve the patient experience as best possible. The first prong in that was to move beyond the bite block to a frameless and maskless approach. Uh, we really wanted at first to call it FMB, so frameless, maskless, bite blockless radio surgery, and really wanted it to be uh, truly maskless, but I'll show eventually we accepted the, the use of the, the minimal mask um, 
just due to logistics, but I'll show a picture. And then the second goal is to further make efficiency gains where possible in the actual delivery and planning of treatment. That's the flattening filter free, the rapid arc, et cetera, component of things. So for surface guidance, we have been using the AlignRT system. It's non-invasive, non-ionizing. We're going to see these types of pictures a lot today. Um, it does directly image the surface of the patient, does not image the tumor, of course, unless that was on the surface of the patient, um, but it provides a, uh, a method of real-time motion management during uh, delivery of treatment. That's just an example of the, the newer camera. Um, I think you'll get lots of technical descriptions of the cameras today. There's several cameras, including this red speckle projector, which is what you actually see on the, on the patient. So the system calculates point-to-surface displacement and of, in, of a real-time surface image compared to a reference image acquired previously. That reference image can be the body contour from CT done at simulation. It can be uh, from another AlignRT system in the CT sim room. It can be from an image acquired previously that session by VisionRT or an image from a previous treatment session. And then the system obtains the point-to-surface distance between the reference image and the real-time acquired image with those deltas displayed in real-time in six degrees of freedom. This is, again, just an example of the um, camera system in a treatment vault, and then that's the speckle projector. That's what you actually see on the patient as you're monitoring, the, setting up and monitoring them. And this is an example screen grab showing the translations vertical, longitudinal, and lateral, as well as uh, rotation, roll, and pitch, and a vector displacement. There's a tracing in, in real time as the reference and acquired images are compared. So the first step uh, before clinical use of this system was we wanted to evaluate the system itself. And we were using the ZMED system, which was the bite block system at the time. So just plan to compare the two systems, the AlignRT system and the ZMED system. And in order to do so, just it was pretty simple, just attach the uh, bite block array to the end of the table and tape the head phantom to the table and then introduce, had a, a vault with both systems running and then introduced known couch translations and just essentially compared the agreement between the two. And this is kind of a busier slide, but shown out there in red is that the two systems had very good agreement. It was uh, frequently less than half a millimeter and essentially always less than a millimeter. So from this, we felt like the system itself was robust enough for utilization in radiosurgical applications. Then the next question was how realistic was it that people could potentially just lay still for 20 minutes with relatively minimal immobilization? And, um, and it turns out to be fairly realistic. These were just some volunteers. We had, I think, 12, yeah, 12 volunteers. We made a head mold and had them lie still on the table for 20 minutes, which is shown out there at the end of the x-axis. And there's a little bit of drift. Like you can see that volunteer three had a bit of drift. But still, I would just point out the scale. That's a, a rotation drift. And that line is a half a degree. So still, these are very small shifts. But we felt pretty good uh, that most patients are able to lie down relatively still for 20 minutes if they're comfortable. And, um, but beyond that, it's probably pushing it a bit. And then secondarily, if they aren't able to lie still, then you'll notice it. That's the point of the cameras. It's not necessarily saying that people won't move. It's just a question of, but we'll know it if they do. So we can stop and then adjust as needed. Um, this is a, just a picture with the original Go. Again, really just because we wanted to say that it was maskless and felt like that was going to be um, good, but also cool. And so this was this mold system that required mixing of various sort of potions. And it, it just was not practical. It was really difficult on the therapists. And it was actually probably more uncomfortable than the minimally active mass, just because people got stuck in it. You had to cut out bits of the foam, and, and then it was hard to get back in it uh, for treatment. So we ab essentially abandoned that, at least for now. Though I would agree if we can go back to a maskless situation at some point, then great. But le less mask is still better than more mask. No mask would be better than less, but less is still progress, a real tangible thing to advance the, um, the, the experience. Um, so this is our current workflow and has been now for, uh, I've been using uh, SGRT for radio surgery for close to 10 years now, which is, sounds crazy, but it's true. So patients undergo simulation like normal, at which time we create the mask. We create our plan in whatever planning system you use. We use Eclipse. Uh, that plan is then exported as well as uh, structures from the treatment planning system and into the AlignRT system. At treatment, we set the patients up initially using the CT body contour. We don't have an AlignRT system in the, uh, in the sim room. You, you, can, you could use that as well, but we just don't have that. So we use the CT body contour as the reference image, and then we do use um, o, uh, IGRT, OBI imaging, and cone beam CT to uh, finalize positioning. Once the positioning has been finalized, we acquire a new reference image, uh, which serves as the gold standard for delivery of that treatment, and then treat, monitor, and adjust the patients if needed. And as we started to use that, similar to with the optical array, we wanted to evaluate if we were missing, if we were 
doing a good job uh, of the medical part of things. And it turned out this was the first 44 patients with 115 lesions, the 12-month uh, local control, 84%. That's going to kind of keep coming up in a number of series. It's always somewhere around 80%. So we felt like, nope, that's, that's what this number always is. That's what that number's supposed to be. And so we felt comfortable using, uh, using SGRT for SRS and have since. And when I say that it's our SRS solution, it's our SRS solution across the board. That was a series of patients with metastatic disease. Um, this is a series much smaller, but a series of patients with trigeminal neuralgia. That's what people are always most nervous about with radio surgery, that that much dose right next to the brain stem. You know, would you use it for trigeminal neuralgia? To which I say, yes, we do use it for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and schwannoma, meningioma, all of it. And again, this is a small series. Um, but it's long enough to have followed the median, I think it's 36 months, long enough to have some idea of toxicity. And we didn't see any brainstem toxicity and, and um, pain scores response in, in line with expectations. So parallel to the evolution uh, to SGRT for radio surgery delivery, uh, but overlapping again in the overriding theme of improving the patient experience, uh, I would say the second prong of improved efficiency includes simultaneous treatment of multiple lesions and then the incorporation of of rapid arc and flattening filter free to shorten beam on time and really try to get these treatments done in as little a time or short a time as possible. Of course, with simultaneous treatment of multiple lesions with a single isocenter, the, the stakes are raised a bit for setup and positioning errors in that one error at that point could then translate to missing all of the targets rather than just one if they were treated sequentially. But we didn't see that uh, frameless surface guided SRS. This was a, another series. Patients had two to 13 uh, metastatic lesions all treated with single isocenter plans. These were static gantry angle, non-VMAT plans. Um, but we didn't see geographic misses. It's kind of a busy slide. But shown at the bottom there is our actuarial one-year local control, 83%. So it's that same number. It's always right around 83%. So we felt comfortable that we weren't missing. But the big gain for those patients was that treatment times were then down to about 20 minutes, which seems to be kind of the magic number. People are good for about 20 minutes. So um, this was with or sorry, simultaneous treatment. It was about 20 minutes of treatment time. That compares really favorably to the time people spend in the gamma knife and also compares favorably to just sequential treatment of multiple brain metastases. Again, that was pre-VMAT and uh, using static gantry angles and also pre flattening filter free. If we incorporate uh, rapid arc and flattening filter free mode, we did some plan comparisons of the 6X rapid arc versus 6FFF and found those plans, I would say they're visually indistinguishable plans, uh, but there is, and their monitor units are fairly similar. The DVHs are also essentially superimposable, but importantly, the beam on time is reduced by about 43% by using the flattening filter free mode. I have an example patient coming up, uh, just kind of walk through this, but that's been our approach typically is single isocenter uh, for the most part, um, rapid arc or VMAT planning, flattening filter free, surface guided radio surgery in a standard 20 minute time slot. This is just an update of that previous report. Uh, this time it's all patients treated with uh, SGRT, VMAT, rapid arc, flattening filter free. So it's 15 patients, uh, mostly two arcs, sometimes three to four, and the control of the treated lesions was still 81.5%. So again, it's always kind of right around in that same time. But the main gain from this is treatment times with, uh, with all of those efficiency gains are on the order of about seven minutes. And that's, I don't think that's too much of an ask. That's pretty good. People are able to do that. As we take a step back and just consider the utilization of SRS in general and why efficiency might matter uh, beyond the, um, the importance of patient comfort, and it's, I think no one wants to lay there for a minute longer than they have to. So if you can do it quicker, then uh, you'll get little argument from patients about that. This is just a table from a, a nice review article now. But the candidate group, uh, the, the population of candidate patients for radio surgery just continues to grow. Uh, we now have four randomized controlled trials showing that whole brain radiation in addition to SRS improves local control and does improve distant control, but it doesn't improve overall survival, uh, particularly in patients with uh, limited brain metastases, and it does have negative impact on cognition as well as hair loss and the time constraint of making someone come to the clinic for two or three weeks or however long you do it. With close follow-up and repeat SRS for salvage, most of these patients can retain their hair, intact cognition, and, and then ultimately, unfortunately, pass away. But from systemic disease progression, most of them do not pass away from uh, neurologic death. So we do radio surgery more and more, and this is kind of reflected now in the, the Astro Choose Wisely statements, which says don't routinely add adjuvant whole brain radiation therapy to uh, SRS for limited brain metastases, as well as the NCCN guideline statement that has SRS listed as the preferred treatment strategy up front. That's changed just within my own career. I'm not that old, but in the last handful of years, it seems that it used to be everyone got whole brain radiation, maybe some radio surgery boosts, and now that's really flipped around. So there are just more and more patients getting radio surgery. 
it's definitely less clear what we should do uh, for patients with more extensive disease, say four or more metastatic deposits. We don't have level one evidence to guide that uh, area of decision making, but still, SRS is a reasonable consideration. It says whole brain radiation or SRS, mainly with that decision making driven by other characteristics like systemic treatment options, control of systemic disease, patient performance status, et cetera, and having less to do with um, the, the specific number of metastases. Of course, the concern with uh, SRS for extensive metastasis is largely twofold. If someone has a higher number of target lesions within the brain, then of course there's more radiation going to the brain, so will that translate to increased toxicity? And then secondarily, are patients with in increased burden of intracranial disease, are they just destined to florid intracranial failure, in which case whole brain radiation therapy would, would be indicated for them and you would be wasting their time by giving them focal treatment on a dozen spots if they're just going to get a dozen more a month later. But it turns out that really isn't typically seen. Again, we don't have level one evidence here, and this is just a nice summary table. The outline in red is the one of these series that's actually prospective, um, the Yamamoto paper. So they took patients with brain metastases, grouped them into two groups, one metastasis, two to four, and four to ten, and actually found that neurologic death, uh, and they all got radio surgery, that neurologic death, toxicity, and overall survival were just similar for the group of patients who had two to four lesions as the group that had five to ten. And then importantly, the majority of the patients did not get salvage whole brain radiation therapy, but about half did get salvage SRS. So that's our current practice, is we typically make decisions based on um, factors less important is the number of metastasis, but more important is the patient's performance status, where they are with their systemic disease. A lot of patients are newly diagnosed. The medical oncologists want us to hurry up and get done with them so they can start their systemic treatment, which of course is a valid goal. And then whole brain has the known negatives of hair loss, which we sometimes minimize, but not, I would say patients don't, and, uh, and then which nobody minimizes the cognitive impact. So, I think what we try to do is uh, avoid whole brain, at least up front, as much as possible, which is part of what I think is our patient-centric uh, approach to try to maximize comfort. We do tell people there's about a 50 percent chance that you'll need more radio surgery down the line, but if it's not such a traumatic experience, um, then, uh, you know, and I wouldn't minimize treatment for anybody, but that's really not so bad. Um, this is just an example patient. Um, she presented with... Uh, right-sided non-small cell lung cancer had limited burden of metastatic disease that diagnosis, including that single brain metastasis shown with the red arrow. So she got radio surgery at that point and then began her systemic treatment. And about a year or so later, she had a, a serial MRI, just a surveillance MRI that showed two new metastatic deposits. So she came back and we discussed options at that point, including uh, whole brain radiotherapy versus repeat SRS, uh, pushing her somewhat towards repeat SRS, which she elected to go with. So uh, here she is coming for CT simulation, going to get her mask made, her open face mask made. And um, there's Reagan and Sarah making her mask. We then do CT with 1.25 millimeter slices, uh, scan through the shoulders just so we can have that body contour uh, all the way down to the shoulders and avoid any um, gantry, hit, gantry interference. And then one to two days prior to treatment, we do a planning MRI done in the face mask. Um, and in the, we ha we're lucky enough that the MRI unit happens to be right across the hall from our CT simulation, so they're able to get that done uh, relatively easily. Those are her two treated lesions. We do all of our treatment planning in Eclipse. Um, we try to treat, as I said before, try to treat single isocenter simultaneous treatment, but hers were just too far apart. And so her, her plan with regards to her normal brain dosimetry was a lot better with uh, sequential treatment, two isocenter or two separate plans. We had a millimeter margin on GTV or PTV. We have a neurosurgeon. Uh, involved in the contouring and plan review aspect of that. Um, this is, again, her two isocenter plan. Um, so then when she comes back for treatment, the mask is fitted, and then, as I said, the initial positioning is done using the body contour from her CT simulation as the reference image. So she lies down, mask is fitted, and we turn the system on. There's a uh, Vision RT console in the treatment room, which is used for initial positioning, so the therapists are looking at that console as they adjust her. Obviously, she's not in a not ideally positioned right there, but they make some shifts and to get her quite close. We all step out, the cameras are on, there's that red speckle projection that I mentioned before, and she's not, a, well, she is minimally immobilized with the mask, but as you see, there's no nothing else. Uh, we step out, we do use KVOBI for verification, and then we also do cone beam CT imaging. Uh, her position is fine-tuned just a little bit. Usually there's small shifts that are made. After the fine-tuning, we take a new reference image and then use that for interfraction monitoring and monitor her throughout delivery of treatment. At completion, uh, we have this document automatically created in our ARIA system, uh, which is saved in her file, including her treatment time, which is probably hard to see, but 
So her treatment time is about seven and a half minutes. That's not the whole story. That Really, that was just one of the lesions because hers were treated sequentially, not simultaneously. But she still was done with treatment of both of her lesions in about 15 minutes. And um, I think about as comfortable a way as possible, at least today. Her follow-up MRI now, nine months after treatment, the lesion one is essentially gone. Lesion two also essentially gone. She continues to have an excellent performance status. She's got all her hair, and she's got intact cognition, which I would say is a win for her. So transitioning now to body, uh, focusing primarily on lung, or, or really only on lung SBRT for this talk. Just as introduction and background, I think we have kind of a varied audience today. Uh, the utilization of SBRT has really increased over the past five to 10 years as well, and, and really that's just been fueled by such encouraging results. Here's the results from just one of a number of series. This is the first North American cooperative group trial of lung SBRT, the RTOG0236 trial. These patients all had biopsy-proven early-stage non-small cell lung cancer. They got 60 gray in three fractions. It's 55 patients um, followed for about three years, and the results are really quite good. 98% local control with no marginal recurrences. The three-year disease-free and overall survival are not so great, but that's largely reflective of the, the medical comorbidities that this sick group of population or sick population of patients presented with. They're all medically inoperable. And that was then followed by the RTOG 0618 trial, which was also single arm experience, a little bit different fractionation, 18 times three instead of 20 times three over one and a half to two weeks, but still with excellent local control at 96%. And in this series, uh, in medically operable patients, the overall survival was about, whoops, was about 84%, which just reflects a healthier group of patients at baseline. But really, as I said, the you could pick any of a number of series. Long SBRT with lots of different fractionations works quite well from 30 gray times one to seven and a half times eight and lots of things in between. And the local control sort of similar to those brain series. It's always 80% or better. There have been a couple of attempts at uh, randomized trials. This is just the combined results of two of them, the STARS and Roselle trial. They both closed early, uh, which is not a surprise. Typically, patients and physicians have, at least in the U.S., they have a really hard time uh, accepting randomization to surgery or non-surgery. Patients and doctors, they kind of want to have a hand in that and not leave a decision like that to chance. Uh, so they don't accrue well, they, or they almost never accrue well. This only included 58 patients total, but they're all operable, randomized to lobectomy with a mediastinal lymph node dissection or uh, SBRT, which they called SAVER in that trial. And in these combined results, again, small numbers, but the recurrence-free survival was the same. The overall survival actually favored radiosurgery over formal resection, which is thought uh, either to be just a statistical anomaly or, uh, if that's real, it's likely due to the resultant hit in medical comorbidities that surgery entails. Those patients are operable, but they're typically not ideal in their health. And so there were, like, there was one surgical mortality, and there were no, no, of course, no immediate mortalities with radiosurgery. There's an ongoing VA trial, the Valor trial, that hopes to answer that question. But the point of this is that uh, SBRT for primary lung cancer continues to, also like the brain radio surgery, the indication continues to expand. The current ASTRO guideline uh, continues to endorse surgery for medically operable patients with standard risk, but the important change in the current uh, practice guideline is that there is encouragement of discussion of SBRT in patients who are considered high operative risk, and that's, I think, a big step forward towards the increasing adoption of uh, lung SBRT as a standard treatment, which my own personal belief, biased as it is, is that, that that's coming. So the big change as we move from the body to the brain, of course, is the acknowledgement that people breathe. And as they breathe, there's the, at least the potential that some target motion would be encountered and have to be dealt with. So there are several strategies uh, that exist for motion management. A 4D CT simulation can be used to then uh, deliver treatment that's gated, or you can create an ITV based on a MIP or use a breath hold. Those are the two options that we do in, in my clinic is the ITV or breath hold. Abdominal compression is also an option, slow CT or ABC, uh, active breathing control. What we uh, typically do in our, in our clinic is we do a 4D CT simulation and then we either create an ITV uh, based on um, the MIP if there's not much motion or use breath hold if there is. And typically, shown here, typically patients with upper lobe lesions are able to have treatment with free breathing and just create an ITV based on the MIP. And as you get closer to the diaphragm, there's an expectation that there'll be more respiratory motion. And most of those patients do better holding their breath. We use 12 gray times four as our main fractionation. Again, there's lots of different fractionations. We just picked that one because it was in the RTOG 0915. We're a small uh, county hospital. And if we use RTOG fractionations, then we can use their constraints. And it feels very comforting to the dosimetrists and physicists that we're using something that's well endorsed. Um, 
So this is an example patient uh, for this. He's uh, lucky enough to have two simultaneous but distinct lung cancers. On his left was, uh, I don't remember which one was adeno and which one was squamous, but one, of, so that's how we knew they were different. He had a bigger tumor on the left and then a smaller tumor on the right. He was an operative candidate for a lobectomy, but not for two lobectomies. So he had uh, underwent lobectomy with mediastinal lymph node dissection on the left, found to be lymph node negative, but he did get adjuvant chemotherapy based on the size of that left tumor. And then as he completed chemotherapy, uh, the plan was for radiosurgery to his contralateral separate primary. Um, and at 40 CT sim, he did demonstrate substantial respiratory, or the target demonstrated substantial respiratory motion. So he had three breath hold scans done. That also allows us to evaluate for the reproducibility of the breath hold because they can, they should hopefully all be essentially the same. We then use uh, velocity to register those images and contour the GTV on all three of his breath hold scans. Those are then imported to Eclipse, where we use um, Eclipse for planning. We do the same as the brain, rapid arc plans with the flattening filter free. The PTV is created by adding a margin to all three of those breath hold GTVs, typically five millimeters around and uh, up to 10 millimeters supininth, though that can vary. We use IGRT for setup of these patients, starting with a free breathing KV OBI. We then take a breath hold cone beam CT. Typically, it takes patients two breath holds to get the, the full cone beam CT done. Um, sometimes they can do it in one, but almost never. And of course, you can see the volume loss on the left from his prior lobectomy. After we've done the breath hold uh, cone beam CT, that's registered with his breath hold simulation images, and that's how we verify his positioning for treatment. He then is allowed to breathe normally, he or she, this is just a he, but anyone, is allowed to breathe normally. And then there's Teresa watching him breathe. The intercom then, she'll say, all right, take a deep breath. When you're ready, take a breath and hold it. He takes a deep breath in, and then he's all greens, and everyone feels good about his positioning. You can, of course, see his breathing trace go from the normal oscillation of his regular breathing to this flat line as he holds his breath, and then we all monitor for stability as his treatment begins. In general, these are two arc plans, almost always, and in general, it ends up being about 1,500 monitor units per arc, so if 1,400 monitor units per minute, um, it's about a minute per arc. Uh, almost no one can hold their breath for a whole minute, but that's fine. We let them have a, a say in how often they want to have breathing breaks. Some patients say, just watch, and, and I'm going to go as long as I can. And when you see me slip, because of course you can, you can see them slip. And as soon as they slide out of tolerance, we just pause and tell them, okay, take a breath. Some patients say, I, I do better. I'm going to count to 10 in my brain, and I just want, I want to know when my break is coming. And, and either of those is fine. Uh, the important thing would just be for them to know ahead of time how you're, how you're planning on doing it. Uh, but everybody requires at least one break. I would say almost nobody can hold their breath for a whole minute, particularly after they would have just held it for a minute to do the imaging. So at completion of treatment, we get the same report printed out in ARIA as we do for the brain patients. And then the real just take home there was that, so his radio surgery took about 12 minutes. Um, and he tolerated treatment well. His most recent CT scan was only about four or six months after treatment, but he's got res resolution of the nodule. There's, of course, some radiation effect, as expected, but no residual nodule, and, and he's really doing quite great, particularly for someone with two lung cancers. At my own county hospital, we started doing SBRT or radiosurgery in general in January of 15, so we went from, uh, we actually didn't, we had two old clinics, a 2100 and a 2300. We bought a true beam in November of 14 and started doing radiosurgery in January 15. I think heard that analogy called we went from no phones to cell phones. We just skipped a bunch of generations in between and started a prospective registry trial in August of 17. Treated over 300 patients total so far. Not all of them are on that registry, but I just took a look back before coming here uh, through those patients, just specifically looking at the, the stage one lung cancer patients, of which there were 37 medically inoperable. 14 of them didn't even have biopsy. Generally, that's due to concern from the IR folks about pneumothorax. Most of them have 12 grade times four or 12 grade times five fractionations. The median follow-up in our little uh, cohort is, of course, short because we haven't been doing this registry for long. But crude local control at 95% is about what we would expect that to be <laughs> thus far. Those failures, one of them is, is for sure a failure. He had local, regional, and distant progression, and one is kind of iffy. There was a slight increase on a most recent CT scan, which may or may not uh, persist. I mean, we've also found toxicities to be minimal. There was one patient who passed away, though not related to treatment. This was a hospital-acquired pneumonia in the contralateral lung after an admission for a, a skeletal event, a head fracture. So, and then last, um, not a little SGRT anecdote, not radiosurgery, just sort of a little bit interesting, but I think related to the question of comfort for positioning as well as the ongoing effort to minimize immobilization. This was a woman 
who came in with no known cancer history but had an obviously neglected and far advanced malignant process, lots of pain, widespread metastatic disease, including those quite large erosive calvarial lesions seen there. She also had an impending fracture of the right humerus, which is why she's in a splint there. And poor thing, she just was miserable and uncomfortable no matter how she lay down. So she, uh, she couldn't tolerate a mask at all. She couldn't lie flat. And um, we just essentially said, so just lie how you can. Lay there in whatever position you can make yourself moderately comfortable. And we did her CT with her basically like that, um, which is, of course, not an ideal position. And then at the time of treatment, we just had her lie down again, essentially the same position. She, I said no immobilization. She does have that little bit of masking tape on her forehead. Um, but so we had her lie down and then use the system. She was way out, of course, at first, but just adjusted her positioning in the room uh, using the in-room vision RT to match her positioning to simulation. We then step out of the room, continue monitoring her on the camera. We did verify her positioning with IGRT, um, and she had a good match. And really just uh, the point of that is just that we treated her, and, and I think we could treat more and more people with no immobilization, just SGRT throughout the delivery of treatment. So in conclusion, I would say that um, radio surgery is an effective treatment, and uh, it can be effectively and safely done with a frameless SGRT approach. It's comfortable for patients, or at least less uncomfortable, uh, which is progress. I'm sure, it's not ideal, but it's progress. Um, SVRT itself is an appealing treatment strategy for spine, lung, liver. I didn't cover spine or liver, but, um, <clears throat> but lung treatment. And incorporation of SGRT in one's clinic can help to facilitate a streamlined approach to delivery and get these patients off the table, not just because we want to go fast, but because we want them to not be miserable. And that's the end. I'm happy to try to answer any questions.